Hello and welcome to our final episode on our walk through the Ten Commandments, that uh, perfect summary of Christian morality. We're looking at the Ninth and Tenth Commandments, at least in the Lutheran tradition, where God commands us not to covet. We're talking about this very unique commandment where God is not so much addressing outward actions, but instead inward attitudes and thoughts. Uh, this is a really valuable commandment for us because, again, kind of like uh, the very first commandment, that if we really do fear, love, and trust in God above all things, we're not going to break any other commandments. In the same way, if we really don't covet, uh, then we lose any real reason to break any of the other commandments against our neighbor. If we learn to be content with the things that God has given us, uh, we're not going to have a desire to murder or steal or badmouth or slander, uh, give false testimony against our neighbor, right? Uh, so we want to dig in here. Uh, and ask this question, though. Last time in the last video, uh, we talked about the uh, secret of being content, this gift that God has given to you that you can be joyful uh, no matter where you are in life because of the gifts that God has given to you instead of being constantly focused on what you don't have. In this video, we're going to ask the question, well, what about when life is really bad? Uh, what about when you really are going through the ringer? Uh, how can you really be content during those moments in life? Uh, by the way, if you missed that first part, uh, I will put a, a link in the description of this video, so please do check that out. Um, but anyway, in this video, we want to ask the question, well, what about, yeah, what about when it's really rough? What about when life is absolutely painful, absolutely a burden? Can you really be content in those situations? Uh, and I'm going to throw four people at you today uh, from the Bible who went through absolutely miserable lives, and yet these people were all able to find... Uh, contentment, despite that hardship, despite the struggles that they were in. And the first guy we want to look at is Job. Job uh, is a fascinating man from the scriptures. He's a very complex individual in the Bible. Uh, he was a good man, we read. He was righteous. Uh, he followed God's will for his life, uh, and he was uh, very wealthy. He had a lot of stuff, a lot of worldly wealth. He had a, a huge and loving family, a ton of kids, uh, and it was an awesome time for him. Uh, however, one day, uh, God allowed Satan to take all of his wealth, all of his family away from him, only as his wife was still alive, but she, as she was going through that same burden of loss, uh, she lost her integrity quite, quite quickly. Um, but Job, as he is going through this, these horrible sufferings, as he's losing all of this stuff in just a, a small amount of time, Job's response to all of that was, the Lord has given to me and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. This is kind of what we talked about in the previous video that uh, where Paul talks about having learned the secret of being content in every situation. There Job recognizes that God is ultimately the one who is both giving him good and allowing trouble into his life. And since he does trust God, since he does love God, he knows that he can be content with everything. Let's dig in a little bit more and hear from Job's own words, uh, the immense suffering that he's going through. Like I said, Job is a complex individual. Uh, it's not simply that he was just stoically, I am okay with this, even though all this horrible stuff happened. As you read through the full the full book of Job, uh, you find Job is complaining quite a lot, and he's got a lot uh, to complain about. But in the middle of all that complaining, in the middle of all the depression, uh, the very real, serious, uh, dark place that Job is in, uh, in which he's wishing that he was just never born at all even, uh, Job still has this quiet integrity. He has this quiet strength that he is able to continue walking with, continue standing up in the middle with, uh, even though he is in such a dark place. Uh, and so in Job 19, we want to grab these words uh, from Job, starting with verse 17. Job says, My breath keeps my wife away from me, and I am repulsive to my mother's children. Even young boys reject me. When I get up, they speak against me. My closest confidence shun me. And those, I have and, and those I love have turned against me. I am nothing but skin and bones. I have escaped with the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, you friends of mine, because the hand of God has struck me. Why do you pursue me the way God does? Will you never get enough of my flesh? Oh, how I wish that my words were written down. Oh, how I wish that they were inscribed in bronze. That they, were, that they would be engraved in rock forever with an iron tool and letters filled with lead. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives 
and that in the and that at the end of time he will stand over the dust. Then even after my skin has been destroyed, nevertheless, in my own flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with or my own eyes will see him and not as a stranger. My emotions are in turmoil within me. Kind of fascinating words here from Job. He describes a little bit more of the uh, suffering that he goes through. It's not only that he lost all of that stuff, but his own reputation had also uh, been, been harmed by all this suffering. Uh, a good lesson for us not to, uh, uh, like we talked about when we talked about having a good name, uh, we don't look down on people just because they are going through hard times. Um, but Job here acknowledges all of his suffering, acknowledges all this hardship and pain in himself, and yet he recognizes too that he still has this very, very small, but a, a glimmer of hope in his life. He is looking forward to the resurrection. He is looking forward to that moment when he can stand face to face with God. He knows that he has been paid for and that so, and because of that, he doesn't curse God. Because of that, he doesn't let go of his integrity. Instead, he continues to bear this burden that God has laid in his lap. He continues to trust in his God even though he is very much concerned about what God is doing in his life, even though he is uh, demanding that God explain himself, uh, nevertheless, he holds on to this glimmer of hope that God gives to him. And so in the same way, when you and I go through brutal times in our lives, we can still cling to those blessings that God has given us. Last time we when we talked about contentment, we talked about how God has just given you this moment right here, right? And you can be thankful for that. However, uh, recognize also as a Christian, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have far more than just this moment. You are looking forward to the resurrection from the grave. And since you are looking forward to eternal life with God, that can give you hope. That can give you a foundation that can never be taken away from you. The next section that we want to look at is Lamentations chapter 3. These are likely the words of Jeremiah, a prophet from God who, again, faithfully uh, gave Israel, the words that God had given him to speak. Uh, and yet, as he did all that faithfully, he was horribly abused for that. People did not like to hear the messages that he gave. Uh, and then finally, uh, after all of his faithful work, uh, his reward was to watch the nation that he knew and loved burn down around him. Lamentations is uh, likely him sitting in the ashes of Jerusalem and looking back on this horrible suffering that God has allowed into his life uh, as all the people that he knows and loves uh, have either died or been dragged away into exile or are sitting there in the ashes with him. Uh, and this is what, Joe, or what Jeremiah says in Lamentations chapter 3, starting at verse 17. He says, and he's talking to God here, notice this. He says, you deprived my soul of peace. I have forgotten what well-being is. I said my endurance has vanished along with my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my homeless wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. My soul always remembers, and it has sunk within me. Nevertheless, I keep this in my heart. This is the reason I have hope. By the mercies of the Lord, we are not consumed, for his compassions do not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. My soul says the Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good to hope quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bears a yoke early in his life. Let him sit alone and be silent because the Lord has laid this upon him. Let him stick his face in the dust. Perhaps there still is hope. Let him turn his cheek toward the one who, would, who strikes him. Let him be filled with disgrace for the Lord will not push us away forever. Even though he brings grief, he will show compassion on the basis of his great mercy. Certainly it is not what his heart desires when he causes affliction, when he brings grief to the children of men. Notice, the, again, the, this brutal moment in Jeremiah's life that he recognizes God has again allowed this horrible suffering into his life. And yet, as he dwells on this horrible pain that he's going through, he acknowledges, you know what, There's this is still good. It is still good because God has given this burden to me. And therefore, it's, it's good for me to, to learn to quietly wait for God to bring his salvation for me. It is good to bear a burden. In fact, he even says it's good for people in general to, to bear a yoke while they're young, right? Uh, that in the early times of your life, if you go through suffering, that can often uh, make you a more hardened, a more uh, trustworthy, a more uh, stalwart uh, individual. 
right? It can actually make you into a more, uh, get, it can build character in you rather, right? Uh, and so Jeremiah recognizes this suffering to ultimately result as a good thing. And so again, Jeremiah has this hope, this confidence that he can bear this burden and wait for God to bring him salvation, wait for God to save him from this calamity. The third individual we want to look at right now is Elijah. Uh, we read about him in 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, and here Elijah has, uh, he's convinced that his life's work as a prophet of God uh, has come to nothing. He believes he is the only Christian, uh, the only believer in the one true God left in the world. Uh, and he's ready just to die and be done with it. Uh, so this, this guy, everything he's worked for has just fallen apart in front of him. Uh, and so he's ready just to be done. Uh, and so here, God gives him some really valuable lessons, lessons that we also can learn, especially in those times when we're going through uh, difficulties, hard struggles. Uh, and so here we read from 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah came, or Elijah went to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord suddenly came to him saying, why are you here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of armies, but the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant. They have tore down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking to take my life. Then the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains and shattered rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind came an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a soft, whispering voice. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. Then a voice came to him and said, Why are you here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of armies, but the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the wilderness of Damascus. When you get there, you are to anoint Hazael as king over Aram. You will also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah, as pro prophet in your place. Whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. But I have preserved in Israel 7,000 whose knees have not bent to Baal and whose lips have not kissed him. Two lessons uh, that Elijah takes away here. First off, uh, God shows Elijah that he does not always work the way that you and I would think he should work. Right? Again, this is often something that can happen when life goes wrong in our lives. Uh, sometimes that's an opportunity for us to learn some humility. To recognize, like we talked about in the first commandment, that we are not God. We are not in control of everything. Uh, and so we have to learn to accept what God allows into our lives. We have to recognize that he is working in ways that are far beyond us. And so we have to learn to be content, to be okay with what God has placed into our lap. Furthermore, God tells uh, Elijah that even though he thinks it's over, uh, God still has a mission for him. God still has plans that he is accomplishing, and Elijah still fits into those plans. In the same way, you and I, even when we are in the midst of, of a terrible burden that God has laid in our lap, it's incredibly valuable for us to learn to accept that burden, to pick it up willingly, and to charge forward accomplishing those missions that our God has given to us in life, continuing to do the good that God has given us to do. Now, we talked a lot about uh, the, the difficulty in this commandment of this inner life. Right? Uh, God cares about what our thoughts are. Uh, and as we've talked about this commandment, I think it's obvious that we have fallen short. Right? Uh, I mean, one example that, that uh, always makes me kind of squirm a little bit is imagine if uh, your brain was hooked up to a loudspeaker and everybody around could hear everything that you thought. Right? Uh, for a lot of people, that kind of makes them squirm, right? Because <laughs> we know that our thoughts are not always pure. They are not uh, always good, right? Very much, very often, evil things pop right into our minds. Uh, and God cares about that. In fact, he demands that we have good thoughts always, right? And again, if we, if we actually do have good thoughts, again, that's going to lead to good actions, right? If we allow evil thoughts to linger in our minds, that's going to produce evil in our lives as well, right? So we want to care about these things instead of just ignoring them. And so here as we recognize just how much we have fallen short on this commandment, just how much we have failed uh, to do as our God has commanded, uh, we want to look at one final individual who suffered horribly 
And this man is actually your righteousness. This man is the one who did obey this commandment perfectly in your place. We want to look at Jesus Christ. That before he went to the cross, he was faced with this same difficult uh, commandment. He was faced with this same difficulty of, of pursuing godly thoughts. Uh, and so as Jesus was about to die on the cross, as he was about to endure the, gift, uh, the guilt and the suffering and pain uh, of all humanity, as he was about to take that all onto himself to then receive God's wrath against him, he didn't want to go through with that. That was a horrible burden that God the Father laid in his lap. And yet, as we see in Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus learned to pray that most mature prayer anyone can possibly make, to pray that God's will be done instead of my own will. This is, again, Jesus uh, being the perfect human being in your place. Let's watch this uh, in Matthew chapter 26. We read in verse 36, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. He told his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went a little farther, fell on his face, and prayed. He said, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not as I will but as you will. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, so, you, so were you not able to stay awake with me for one hour? Watch and pray so that you do not fall, enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to pass from me unless I drink it, may your will be done. Again, he returned and found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. He left them again and went away and prayed a third time. He said the same words as before. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Look, my betrayer is near. There's some amazing words from Jesus here. Notice the, the difference between uh, Jesus prayer, or the beginning of Jesus' prayer and the end. Right? As he gets there, he's ready to die. Uh, he, he does not want to go through with this. He is so burdened, so sorrowful uh, that he says he's at the point of death. Right? Uh, he is so anxious. Again, as a true human being, he is very much anxious uh, about what is coming his way, about this horrible burden that God the Father has laid in his lap. Right? And so he prays. He prays, please let this, let this be taken away from me, right? Let me not have to drink this cup of suffering. But again, in his Christian maturity, right? Uh, Jesus says, not what I will, but what you will. And as he keeps praying, you notice his confidence is growing until finally he's able to stand up with his disciples and say, all right, let's go. Let's do it. It's time. I'm going to go through what God has given me to do. I'm going to accomplish the, the good that God the Father has called me to do. And so Jesus goes through with uh, his work for our salvation. He suffers, he dies, he's buried, and then finally he is raised to life again to bring you and me eternal salvation, full forgiveness for all of our moral failings, uh, and now this new life by which we pursue this Christian morality that we've talked through this entire time. My dear friends, may that always be your Christian motivation uh, to continue to love your God with all your heart, soul, and strength and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, that is it for our study on the Ten Commandments, that summary of Christian morality. If you have any questions, please do uh, throw those down in the comments uh, and join us next time uh, as we continue this study. We're going to be jumping into the Creed, the Apostles' Creed, uh, in which we find just a very simple summary of Christian truth. We'll catch you next time. And I say, I say, I say, it can't be that easy. And he said, he said, and no, it wasn't easy. But be still and know.